trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestsellers, all they're hyped up to be. The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Welcome to episode 70 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Chris. This is Paris. Hello. And we're being haunted by some ghosts from another podcast Ooh. today. It's Fuck. Dean Ken from Antiques Freaks back on the TBC getting their teeks freaked. I, I don't know. We're, we're, <laughs> Freaking them we're, getting, we're getting freaky on a peak today, guys. <laughs> yeah. Freak them, Antiques. An- antiques peaks? Ooh, we're like Crimson peaks. Freaks. <laughs> oh, Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, speak that. Well, that's a great segue into what we read today, which was Crimson Peak, the official movie novelization by Nancy Holder, Guillermo del Toro, and Matthew Robbins. Three people had to get in on this, so we had to have a massive amount of people on this podcast to be able to cover everyone's opinions. <laughs> and, and yeah, 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 yeah. This yeah. is a group. This is, we all had to tackle it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, well, I, Paris, usually you do the rest of this intro, so I'm going to bow out here. Oh, yeah. So, hey, uh, if this is, for some reason, this is the first time you're listening to this show, well, buckle the fuck up. What we do here is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of those three things. So we read books that we would never pick up under normal circumstances. Usually this experiment results in a hilariously disappointing read, but once in a while we end up liking the book. Uh, today, we were prompted to read uh, Crimson Peak because Dee and Ken uh, asked us to, and, you know, we had to oblige as they are our <laughs> masters, so. <laughs> it's true. Hey, listen, I pay into your Patreon. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah, but I pay into yours, so you know we're fucking even, all right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I mean, you agreed to it, so. Oh, we've, this, we've this pulled back the curtain. Too. That means curtain, that no. Ken and I are the true neutral parties here. <laughs> you two true. have are all tied up in each other. That's true. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my. Oh, I oh am boy. the one who got three copies of the Crimson Peak novelization from thrift books and mailed them to everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, honestly, like, this would have shown up on our doorstep anyway, so we kind of had to read it. <laughs> this is a man who will make sure you read Crimson Peak. <laughs> Ugh. Like I had to fucking watch it twice now to read it. <laughs> oh God, agony! Absolute at this agony. point, I think Guillermo del Toro should be paying us dividends. Oh, absolutely! Like at least to y'all, because you did you did an episode on the fucking movie too. Yeah, actually, fun uh, fun fact: if you want to learn more, uh, then I guess what Dee and Ken are going to talk about today, you can go and listen to their episode about the movie Crimson Peak. Uh, and if you are a patron, you can listen to me and Chris watch Crimson Peak. We just can't stop peeking. It's just <laughs> everywhere, constantly. It's just, it's uh, just the Antiques Freaks driving you to madness. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I mean, you saw, I'm, I'll, I should probably post the image I sent everyone in the chat of like my prep for the episode. It contains one eight, 8% tall boy and two regular beers. <laughs> That's oh, my I prep. just saw the one beer. I didn't realize oh, there that are there three was... in that lineup. There were three, Chris. Okay, well. So, uh, in addition to our usual barnyard language that you are probably used to if you've listened to either Terrible Book Club or the Antiques Freaks, uh, we'll be discussing a lot of blood, ghosts, some gore, and incest. So, yeah, that's fun. (laughs) Yeah, Um, I was going to say, oh, she's going to say the incest, huh? Well, I mean, this is what content warnings are for. We got to tell you what to expect so that if you are uncomfortable, you can stop listening or, you know, find another episode. Uh, so, yeah, this is a weird one because it, normally uh, movies aren't turned into books. It's normally the other way around where books are turned into film. So, so it's kind of a strange situation. I've never read a novelization of a movie before. Uh, really? And having having already seen the movie, I got to say, oh, boy, it was real boring for me. Uh, 
<laughs> I had no idea this movie even existed oh, yeah, until so- the book got to me, and I was like, oh, it's a movie book. Book movie. Okay. Chris had, a, Chris had the one... <laughs> Chris had the one true experience among us. Then. Yeah, yeah, I think please, you're the one. Please who... tell us about your one true experience of Crimson Peak because I am deathly curious as to what this well, book looks like to someone who hasn't seen the film. Well, ju- just in case uh, listeners haven't heard of this or don't know anything about it, let me just re- read the quick uh, summary or back of the book. <clears throat> when her heart is stolen by a seductive stranger. <laughs> A young woman is swept away to a house atop a mountain of blood-red clay, a place filled with secrets that will haunt her forever. Between desire and darkness, between mystery and madness, lies the truth behind Crimson Peak. From acclaimed director Guillermo del Toro. Why does Guillermo get like the back of the novel name <laughs> drop when like he did, he created he did, it? Did this he write all, it too? Did yeah, he write the movie? This is all his thing. He, he wrote the screenplay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, fair enough, I guess. So, I mean, I guess Nancy and Matt, what are you even doing here? Like, what, why did you need both of them? This is his baby. He his hired a... His a baby. Oh, he's, geez. His inbred baby. <laughs> oh, oh. Too too soon, guys. Too soon. Uh, so, yeah, Chris, what... <laughs> I'm sorry. I just read one of your notes that made me laugh. Uh, Chris, yeah, what was... So, as somebody who is stepping into this totally blind, what was your... <laughs> what was your interpretation I mean, uh, it's the one of the foppiest books I've ever read by far. <laughs> also did I had not- a lot of trouble like remembering that the front portion of it took place in Buffalo, New York, and that yeah. Edith is an American, because everything that I'm reading just comes across as, you know, 19th century British foppery for the most part. Even with certain <laughs> characters in the beginning complaining about, like, oh, these people that haven't earned their keep or what. I don't know. You're all running around in these multi-layered suits and after seeing the movie the hugest sleeves possible oh, <laughs> I, have Even I, have I didn't really get that from the text so you know sleeves. i didn't re- i wasn't aware of the sleeve levels until i saw the movie <laughs> i had to put a red alert for sleeve i didn't Dude. imagine as large of a sleeve area as as was presented to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like which I guess is like the 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 thing. With, cause I got to imagine certain things perhaps a little better than they came off in the film. I don't want to do too much movie book comparing here, but I will say that the book gives actually a little bit more insight into certain things. So I think it's better than the movie. Yeah. Oh yeah. I I'll you agree do? with you there. I'll agree yes. with you there. Yeah. Yes, I do. Wow. Oh wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's strange. No. Incredible. Uh-oh. Are we going to get a podcast divorce, like, on air? Is that no, what's it's, happening? It's valid. <laughs> Here's the thing. It's valid because they're both bad. Yeah. Wow, yeah. It doesn't okay, matter right. which one is better. They're, neither right, is good, cool. but this one is better? <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I mean, yeah, I because... prefer the movie, I think. Definitely prefer the film. Mm. I mean, it definitely looks good, but like, we're we're not going to... All right. We'll, 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 we'll side, sidebar that for, for later. So, <laughs> so our main character's here. Uh, we've got the Cushings, Edith Cushing, who is a young, presumably, I don't know, 17 to 23 year old uh, daughter of a wealthy uh, architect, uh, Mr. Cushing. I forget his first name. Uh, and there they live in Buffalo, New York. Edith is a very modern woman. Uh, her mom died when she was very young and became a ghost that haunts her sometimes with a single message. Um, and, you know, they're living their life and her dad doesn't like anyone who hasn't pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. And Edith is like, yeah, people need to work for their money, even though I'm a fucking heiress. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's one, of the th- <laughs> it's one of the things that really struck me. Uh, she hasn't had to fucking work a day in her life. But anyway, uh, we got the McMichaels. So, uh, primarily Alan McMichael, who is Edith's dearest friend from childhood and he has a super crush on her uh he is now an ophthalmologist and arguably far more attractive than the man cast as the heartthrob in the film uh <laughs> just sidebar paris opinions here <laughs> hardline opinions on tom hiddleston incoming <laughs> yeah, yeah back out, out if here. you like tom hiddleston yeah, like, like Tom Hiddleston needs to be fed a sandwich and like given some light. Like it's like a withering you, plant okay. of a man. 
Parents, God. have you seen oh. the uh, footage of Tom Hiddleston when he tried to gain weight to try out for the role of Thor? Uh, no. <laughs> it's hysterical. He, he tries to beefcake and it's absolutely bonker. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, so in the film. It's like if you tape sandbags to a broom, it's horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he sweeps in, like, doffing his cap like, like a Dickensian hero going, Oh, well, hello there. It's me, the god of thunder. <laughs> I mean, that makes him super appropriate for this role, right? Because yeah, everyone's this, just this fopping around at maximum fop all right, all in right. this whole but thing. But, like, so, in my, I'm, I'm mentioning this because, like I said, I saw the film before I read the book. So, everyone in the book, to me, is just who they were cast as in the film. So, anyway, that's that. Lord Sharp is Tom Hiddleston in my mind uh, forever. He is the Lord and Lady Sharp. We've got... Um, Sir Thomas their, Sharp. Yeah, Sir Thomas Sharp and Lady Lucille Sharp, they are brother and sister from Cumberland, England. They live at Allerdale Hall, a.k.a. Crimson Peak, um, this decaying mansion atop a large hill that is full of red clay. I, I, I already have a little bit of a quibble here, Paris. Sorry to interrupt, but when you say a.k.a. Crimson Peak, right? So <laughs> yeah. at some point uh, in, in early on after Edith meets Thomas Sharp, she he compliments hit her right she's writing a book at work or something she's typing it out and he like happens to glance at one page of her work and goes oh what fantastic writing and this is what prompts you just to fall in love with him completely that's all it fucking takes oh, yeah, we'll talk about that his in, android later. scanner eyes instantly read the entire text <laughs> ghost story this, but, this is, that's not even that's not even the point i'm trying to make here right now i just have to set up the other thing is that she goes home and she like has a book of lords or like a book of british lords and she looks up allerdale Hall in yeah, like, it, which like is... we're in fucking Dark Souls right now. Like, oh yeah, the Book of Lords. Let's... Okay, <laughs> but I mean, if... listen, that's a thing that exists. <laughs> so the the thing her mom ghost warned her about, you know, that one time that her mom ghost decided to haunt her was like, hey, b- beware of Crimson Peak. Just that's the one thing I gotta tell you. I I came back all the way from hell to let you know, <laughs> don't go to Crimson Peak. Why is she in hell? Because she's a capitalist. Of course she's in hell. No, well, she's he, also he like you know a skeleton. I'm assuming if you're a skeleton, you went to hell. It you know <laughs> that's probably not a heaven thing, right? Like, or you went into a womb world. Those are the two sure. options. <laughs> you know, we've learned this too. But anyway, so she's got her book of lords and, and she's reading all about Allerdale Hall. By the way, is is that a thing people would have in America? A book of British lords and their Absolutely, halls? Absolutely, yes. Okay, well, glad that that's up there because I found it to be a very strange thing. Like, why would they care? Anyway. Well, because like, they didn't have Google. Like, you need that. You, need, you gotta know sure. your lords. Sure, but it's so you would think somewhere in this, you know, list of info about uh, the hall here, it would mention that some people call it Crimson Peak. Yeah, no the fucking shit, person, right? Like, the only people that called it Crimson Peak were Mom Ghost and Tom Hiddleston or Lord Sharp. He's the only one that says, like, some people call it Crimson Sir Peak. Sharp, so I think Lord. it's a thing that he calls it to make it seem cool. It's not a thing anyone else has ever called it. My favorite part of that whole like, quibble is definitely that she gets there and it's covered in red and it and like I, I, in the book i think it says that she's like it looks like it's soaked in blood and it and it's a fucking complete surprise to her when he says the words crimson peak like she's yeah, at the yeah. top of a red hill and she's like whoa wait what you guys call this red hill yeah like like <laughs> You're standing in the kitchen and you can see the red, bright red clay <laughs> oozing out of the walls. And she's like, wow, Crimson Peak, huh? Never would have guessed. Yeah, like, like I can't what? believe. <laughs> uh, yeah. She's like been so... frightened by this ghost thing most of her life. So you'd think she would like just avoid any red hill or <laughs> yeah. red raised area in general. Or at least, or at least pay attention when one comes up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, uh, and sorry, sorry, Ken, I could hear the disdain in your voice each time we said Lord instead of Sir. My fucking apologies. It has been changed in the notes to Sir. Before, <laughs> Thank you. Before, before Ken divorces us on the podcast. <laughs> um, He's a mere baronet. He holds no lordship. So I, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, he, I, they all blur together for me. Yeah. Like, can you explain... The rungs here. Okay, so the bottom is the bottom rung raisinette. Is that like where it starts? Yes, it starts at raisinette. raisinettes. Okay. And next comes Junior the Mints. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So at the top, you have the royal family. 
at the very, very bottom of the aristocracy, you have baronets. <laughs> a baronetcy is essentially an inheritable knighthood. So if you get knighted, you are Sir Whatever the Fuck, but your son is still Mr. Whatever the Fuck, and when you die, he will continue to be Mr. Whatever the Fuck. If you get a baronetcy, you are Sir Whatever the Fuck, and then when you die, your son will become Sir Whatever the Fuck. All right, so you're so you descended from a knight and you got a bigger house. That's kind of it. No, but oh. <laughs> I mean, like, like boil it down, right? Like, it's it's you get land and people have to keep calling you sir. Yes, and all of your sons, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Until and the family your... line dies out because you accidentally incest children. Right. Right. Whoops. Uh... Oops it is. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it seems like a pretty common mistake to make. In <laughs> in, in England, yes. In, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Where does should... a, a duke fit into this? Dukes are just under the princes. Okay, so oh, damn, dukes are, are okay. above the baronets. Yes, very far above. Wait, can you... Ev- everyone, everyone except a knight is above a baronet. Earls oh, are above okay. a baronet. Barons are above a baronet, which is delightfully confusing. Not really, because a baronet's like a little baron. Yeah. <laughs> Where so that means that Duke Red Nukem baronet would have had pizza. like a lot of baronets <laughs> under him, like baronet Nukems, perhaps. Baronet Nukem. Baronet minis. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right, so we should probably tell people what the story is because we've just been kind of going on about things. So, all right, Edith. She's very modern, modern girl. She's wealthy because her dad is this architectural baron guy um no he's not he's not a baron uh, yeah, god damn it i was using he's a that. baron of industry yes i was using that's that that's not a real title <laughs> it's not fine no I'll it's just... so much worse if oh, you're gonna lord. be a stickler about me calling him a lord i get to call you out and call him a baron right there oh jesus <laughs> lord uh, wait no not lord <laughs> <laughs> oh baronet oh racinet um all right so edith Mom's dead. Dad's super rich. She wants to be a thoroughly modern girl, so she's a writer, and she's not like all those silly girls. She's not going to marry. <laughs> she's going to write her she's ghost story. She's not like other girls. She drinks beer and eats steak and likes rock music. Yes, exactly. Uh, and so, but it's 1901, so, you know, I don't know. She's... More swing than rock. Uh, no, that, no, we're too early for swing. Uh, anyhow. Well, she's uh, on the cutting edge. We're she's out it. there. That's true, listening. that's true. Cutting edge. So anyhow, uh, yeah, one day she, she's going to the, I don't know, the publisher that her dad knows at, to take her manuscript there to see if she can get her, her novel published. And she's kind of sitting in the reception area after she gets rejected or something, right? Or no, 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 wait, I'm fucking this up. I'm fucking this up. She gets rejected. Then the next thing is like she's at her dad's office uh, using a typewriter, the fancy new typewriter, and it, it looks like she's the receptionist or something. And Sharp, Thomas Sharp, Sir Thomas Sharp walks in, <clears throat> Mr. Raisinet himself, and uh, in with his impossibly tall, stupid hat, and uh, <laughs> he he just he literally takes. A five second look at what she is typing and it's like, oh, this is quite good. And that's it. She is, <laughs> Not even anything and, specific. Like like Chris said, she is instantly enamored with this man just because he has an accent and he says that one of her like three of the words that she wrote are good in in succession. <laughs> because that's the all word. he could have possibly read in that. And time. the only thing we really hear about the story is that there's like a ghost in it and a detective named Cavendish, so I'm gonna assume that the word he read was the ghost went boo. And that's what got him <laughs> Yeah, it, it's He read the sentence, it was a ghost, and he was like, Oh, <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Like there's no way he read anything of consequence. So it's clear that he's just, you know, being a fucking, being a dude, just being an asshole. And he's like, oh, yeah, it's quite good, you know, just to be like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to, like, try to butter up this nice girl because I think she's the receptionist or something. And- he's absolutely the guy who's just like, oh, that's really good. Do you ever read Bukowski? <laughs> <laughs> just like, um, please, fuck off. I mean, because I was thinking about it and I was like, that would be a, that would be like if I played a song from my band for five seconds and someone was like wow you're really good i would be like you don't even you didn't even hear it what that's not a real <laughs> comment like that i don't believe you but no edith's, edith's head over heels immediately and you know her 
poor Alan McMichael, Mr. Ophthalmologist, you know, is back from, I don't know, learning about eyes. And he's been away learning about eyes for a very long time. And he comes back and he's like, hey, I'm back. I'm like kind of attractive and stuff. And I'm a doctor. You know, maybe we should do the thing. And she's like, no, a man told me three words I wrote were amazing. And I've only been <laughs> for five seconds and I'm in love. And <laughs> like, fuck that whole storyline. And she, you know, turns out Thomas Sharp is there to pitch uh, a Shark Tank level idea to. Uh, <laughs> it is a lot ma- like Shark Tank. Yeah, he's he's there for fucking Victorian Shark Tank. He goes up to Mister Cushing's office uh, in like I don't know the boardroom or something with a bunch of other wealthy dudes that I either work for or with Cushing. Um, I think it's a mix of both. So he's making this presentation for investors, you know, in Victorian Shark Tank. Uh, the you know stakes are pretty way high. more mustaches, way oh. bigger and more mustaches, and the mustaches can all vote too. Like that's that's <laughs> the part that's hard. Uh, so he he waltzes in and he's like, "Oh my my family lives on this big hill and it's full of clay and it's the best clay. It makes the best bricks and it bakes so hard and red and bleh. You know, talking about how great this fucking clay is, which I I have no idea if any of that even made any sense. I don't know anything about." clay mining it's extremely good clay is it oh all right wouldn't it always wouldn't it always be cheaper to just get local clay no Mm. he's just really red i don't think they're importing the clay necessarily from him they are investing in his clay company that will operate within england and then send them money yeah they're they're investing in the machine that he's designed and he brings this very impressive little working model of the... Is the, it impressive? Well, <laughs> no it, one well, was impressed. <laughs> it would be well, very impressive if it didn't work backwards. Oh, my God. I'm oh, yes, so glad that, that I was right about this. I'm so glad. Eddie. We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> no, I think it's a perfect time to get to it right now because it kind of sets Thomas up as just a complete idiot from the get-go. <laughs> yeah, because the shit is just <laughs> wired backwards. Right. So, so you see the little model and it's working. And I say it was impressive because in the book, it says that. It says, like, it was actually pretty cool, like, impressive that he had this thing that That's worked. from Edith's point of view, yeah, right? Yeah, and Edith, <laughs> listen, oh, oh, the book right, makes right. one thing very clear, and that's Edith's a fucking idiot. Oh, absolutely. I mean, she's pretty dumb in the movie, but the book elucidates that, certainly, yeah. The, yeah. Book, is like, the book is so intensely horny, I was thrown <laughs> oh, at yeah. how much hornier than the movie it was. <laughs> Oh, dude! Just every every because it was a very horny film. Dude, every couple pages, she's like, "I just wish he was inside me, though." And you're like, "Oh, she's uh, literally, she's, wow! All right." Jesus. In the movie, you're you're actually like, I think your brain glazes over the fact that she's a dipshit because it's like a movie. So you're like, "Yeah, they did have to cut to the chase about how well, she just like fell in love." You're assuming throughout the film that you're watching an actress like emote and shit. So you're like, "Oh, there's probably a, like a light on upstairs there." But then you get into the book and you read all of her private thoughts and it's like, no, no, there's nothing here. She's fully thinking with her pussy the whole time. She's absolutely (laughs) Absolutely. But in a way, in a way that that's actually better because like at least there's a reason she acted so dumb is because she was thinking with her pussy. (laughs) That's why I think the book is better is because we have a clear reason. (laughs) Because you can see that her brain is just a giant vagina is is what's happening. (laughs) But but like like the whole, this, this also upsets me because she's... Early on in the book, too, it kind of she's like, I, like you said before, I'm not like the other girls. I'm writing. I'm not going to get married. But then she immediately just like throws everything out the window just to marry some guy <laughs> yeah. that said he liked one sentence. This is nothing but just like Victorian era, like housewife fantasy, right? Like, yeah, dude. No- yeah, absolutely. It is and extremely like Fifty Shades of Grey level, like internal goddess bullshit. <laughs> it's very like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and like fucking so yeah, so in the movie you don't know what the passage of time is, which is something Chris and I were confused by because we were like, wait a second, how long have they been hanging out? Like days, if that. Uh, well, I think the book <laughs> does the book say the book mentions months, I believe, right? Does it? I can't remember eh, that. I don't know, but. In any case, it's still not a lot of months. It's not that much time to yeah, just be like, oh well, uh, I guess I'll just squander my entire fortune and life away and move to this clay hill 
in England. We've skipped over the whole like banquet dance scene here, which all I right, think all right. is yeah, let's pretty. Back up. Let's back up. All right, let's back up a little bit. So, you know, she instantly falls in love with fucking Raisinette McTop hat over here from the Clay Hills. <laughs> and uh, My favorite flavor. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, isn't it that very night? He's there. Yeah, he shows up at her house because Mr. Cushing doesn't like the mining clay machine. He's like, uh, you have the soft ha- hands I've ever touched, so therefore I'm not <laughs> investing in your clay machine. Yeah, that part because was also soft, pretty womanly hands. An, an incredibly, like, a regular, normal, heterosexual scene. <laughs> yeah. You know, just, yes, yes. Just, just an experienced man of the world complimenting a young stripling on his soft hands. So soft. Well, it's, not, it's, it's actually an insult, you see, <laughs> yeah, because he hasn't worked his... Uh, day in his life with his hands and therefore he's not worth investing in so sir toby sharp decides to go to his house to take his daughter out <laughs> yeah, I'm to the, all right, the, all right. Well, so he yeah, was supposed to be Mr. marrying Mr. the mcmichael he was supposed to be marrying alan mcmichael's sister eunice yeah but she's got so, yeah. too much family yeah so you find out you find out that he's there he was there to try to elicit funds from cushing but he was also uh dating or about to propose to Eunice McMichael, who is Alan's sister and Edith's childhood friend. And, and she's um, such a prep. Oh my god. Oh my god, I stuck yeah. up my middle finger at her. <laughs> uh, yeah, Edith, Edith. Uh, anyway. So uh, there's, there's supposed to be, there's this big party going on that very night, like the night that Cushing rejects Sharp's uh, investment uh, proposal. And it's supposed to be an engagement party for Sir Thomas Sharp and Eunice McMichael. But yeah, uh, he just decides after that, I don't know, five minute interaction with Edith earlier that day that he's just going to go to her house and pick her up and have her come to the ball with him instead. And like, what? I just, I love, I, I love the reciprocity because it's not just bug fuck that she falls in love with him because he reads like three words of her story, but he also falls in love with her based on the three words of her story he read. Like yeah, he read is. the words, yeah. they're a ghost. And he was like, that's the one. It's yeah. her. She's so different. <laughs> yeah, and and I can't I can't help but think that like someone just said I don't remember which of you. It's because Eunice had too much family, and you yes. know, like Eunice had what like a, a brother, a mother, perhaps a father, even, and uh, you know, luckily Edith just has her dad, so less family to have to murder. <laughs> so I guess yeah, we should kind of like <laughs> unveil the whole thing here because the movie makes no bones about hiding the fact that thomas and lucille are up to some shit here the movie is too (laughs) obvious with it they just lay lay it out there you know i think even the book is like a little bit softer about it not entirely but it's not just like cutting to lucille and thomas scheming in another room of the mansion or whatever (laughs) in in like the darkest corner of the next room yeah like like not even that far away in this like big empty house that presumably has some echo in it like if i'm pretty sure i didn't see a lot of doors in the movie anyway lucille and thomas are out here just picking up ladies to get married to thomas so they can uh get the money from them after they murder them with poison later on. And if the plan was to marry Eunice, did they not know she had a larger family? Were they tr- going to have to murder the rest of the McMichael family to get to the money that would have been Eunice's? Because Eunice doesn't just have money on her own, right? She's like a, a, a like the youngest lady in this family. She's like the last one to get anybody, right? As far yeah, as I know. Yeah, I was a little confused about that initial choice as well but maybe they were just desperate <laughs> uh, i don't know it only gets worse though because like the book and and uh, again the movie like actually clips along so like so much faster that you don't notice how weird it is but like the book lays in a lot about the fact that one of the dead wives had a family that she left which opens up even more questions of like wait what like how did you get her money how yeah. is nobody aware that she's dead <laughs> Like, because, like, part of how Edith figures it out is that she starts getting letters from a dead wife, and they're like, please, dead wife, you have to come home to your big, huge Italian family that loves food. <laughs> and, yeah, and, we've and got all like, these Wait, people. Wait, what? How the fuck please. did that... How did he pull that off, and how did they get money out of the deal? Yeah, no, that's true. That is a really... That's a really great plot hole that I actually didn't even consider. Um, That's much later in the story. So, of course... You know, there's just this stupid fucking romance happening that you're like, oh, it's obviously bullshit because, you know, Thomas and Lucille are just going to 
you know, now they're just going to, they've just decided they're going to focus on Edith. Like, that's their new target. Because she's, um, because she's queen dipshit of Idiot Castle. Yeah. And they're like, yeah. well, <laughs> obviously this one. Yeah, seriously. And, and it's weird because, like, so, and obviously Alan is like, oh no, and he's, he's <laughs> really not happy about this. That but is one thing I love about the book. I will say that. Alan, the, the more Alan content we get is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and so... Uh, so yeah, all of a sudden they're like hanging out all the time. It, again, I don't know. I thought the book said that he was courting her for like a couple of months, but maybe it was even less time. In the movie, it's was- literally a fade to black, and then and then it, uh, the curtain rises on another scene, and you're like, "Wait, how long? What is this? Tomorrow? Is this uh, next year? Like, you have no indication of how much time One has passed." One hour later. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. There's really no judgment of time, is there? No, you have no clue. So is death. Uh, yeah, so you have no idea in the movie how long of a time they're going through this courtship or whatever. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm misremembering the book saying it was months, but in any case, they spend some time dating or whatever. And her dad, Cushing, el- the elder Cushing, is like not thrilled about this. He doesn't think that the Sharps are up to snuff. He thinks there's something fucked up about it, so he hires. Uh, he hires, um, this private detective, basically. Mr. Uh, Holly. Mr. Holly. Yeah, he hires I remember because private... he's my favorite character. Yeah. He <laughs> hires him to, uh, hires him to dig up some dirt on them and find out what their deal is. And eventually Holly comes back and is like, oh yeah, they're fucking sketchy. And... It's conceivable that he didn't even have to dig that deep. Like, he just, like, stuck the shovel in the metaphorical dirt for a second. He's like, oh, oh, here it is. That was easy because all he brings back is, like, a marriage document that presumably isn't too hard to procure. I mean, It's more this... difficult in the days before electronic mail. Yeah, definitely that, but, like, the... so Thomas isn't annulling any of these previous man- marriages or Why anything? Why annul them? They're all dead. Sure, but, like, don't you have to do something before you get married again? Not if they're wicked dead. But, oh. uh, well, okay, that does introduce a question I have, which is, why not report the deaths? It's not like in 1901 it was un- uh, uncommon for a woman to die. Yeah, yeah, like, people were dying all the time under wicked, sketchy circumstances, and no one ever gave a shit, so... But presumably, if you're marrying another woman, everyone's gonna be like, what about the other one? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, true. Like, and you'd be like, oh, she died, because this is 1901. She got, like, <laughs> 40 different kinds of flu, and then she exploded, and everyone's gonna be like, yeah, that, that scans. Literally anything can kill a woman. <laughs> Yeah, really. I mean, <laughs> I think in the book Edith says that like like Edith repeats that she's kind of afraid that she might just die of being surprised. The exact yes. quote is rabbits and sick women could die from fright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like and it's one of these stupider lines in a very stupid book. E- even our main yes. character is like, yeah, I guess conceivably anything could kill me. So why not report the deaths? Yeah, well, and it was weird because they make mention, they're like, because I remember Lucille and Thomas were like, oh, yeah, we forgot to do something about that last one. And I was like, what were you going <laughs> to do to make the document go away? I don't know. I mean, yeah. And also, I don't know why that's so damning. He could have just been like, yeah, I had a wife. She kicked it. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, it's not a very damning document because because Pamela Upton, or I think was the document they found, that had that had already been like several years previous, so it was like he could have just been like, "Yeah, my last wife died, whatever." Yeah, like it wasn't. I don't know. It just seems okay. like a weird. So anyway, Mister Holly's like, "Yo, he's oh, already wait, Ken, married." Ken, Ken, Ken has found something. Wait, Ken, what did I spot? Okay, so Pamela Upton was the only woman he married in England. Okay, so that was the only marriage that the English government had record of. So that was the only one Mr. Holly was able to find. Okay, yeah, because the other one was Italian and the other one was Scottish, right? Yep. Okay. So is he marrying them in each country? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He so ma- he, he does have a Edith limited amount. <laughs> he, he, did he? I don't yes. remember him. Oh, all right. Well, cool. I guess that solved that little <laughs> loophole. But now it just brings up the question of, like, he just has to stay out of that country forever after this? Like, he's I just mean, he keeps slowly... going back home to Crimson Peaks. Like, fuck yeah. all these other countries. Yeah, who gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, that, that so anyway, Mr. Holly shows Mr. Cushing, like, yo, he's already married. And Mr. Cushing is like, hi, I knew it. He's a fucking, fucking asshole. 
So he takes, like, right before uh, Thomas is about to propose to Edith, uh, Mr. Cushing calls uh, Thomas and Lucille into his office and is like, all right, the jig is up, assholes. I know you're scheming, so fuck off. Uh, I'm going to give you $3,000, I think, or something to leave, which I guess would have been a lot of money. I don't know how much that That would be. That would be more like hundreds of thousands of dollars today yeah yeah so a fair amount several money which does introduce like the other like big plot question which is why didn't they just take that and leave yeah i know i I because thomas really did love her right like that's (laughs) if they take that check they only get that check if they kill him they get everything no, but I know. It's the like, difference between one dollar and a hundo dollar. Yeah, but they have, then they have to fucking kill a guy, and like someone they've might killed before. Why someone they might give a, give a shit. shit. Well, like no one's giving a shit about anyone they've murdered up to yeah, now. Yeah, but you know what? This seemed motivated by like a lack of knowledge. Like they just it never occurs to them that any anyone might investigate a murder because like, today yeah, sure. no one has investigated <laughs> any of the murders they've committed. Yeah, but this is like a rich guy. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. Gonna this notice. Is, so, D, D, this is one of my main issues with with the book as well. Um, so, like, so, all right. So, you know, Cushing is like, all right, the jig is up. You're both sketchy. Take all of, take this huge pile of money and be gone in the morning. And he tells Thomas, like, you have to break Edith's heart because basically he doesn't want Edith chasing after him. So he tells him, you know, you gotta, you have to thoroughly break her heart. So he basically makes fun of her in front of everyone and says she's a stupid child who doesn't know how to write. And, <laughs> which is you know, true. Right. Which is all yeah. true. Like, yeah. everything yeah. he says that's is correct. correct. <laughs> this is I mean, read. Also, that's all he had to go off, like, anything with her because that's as far as their relationship <laughs> has been built, right? Like, that's the one thing they got. Yeah, really. So, like, he's like, I love your writing. And then 10 seconds later, he's like, joke. I hate your writing. Bazinga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and then like you know, so she slaps him in the face, and she's she's so sad because she doesn't understand why everything seemed to be going so well, and she felt like he was definitely going to propose that night, and then he, you know, it's total opposite. Um, she wakes up in the morning, and turns out he sends her a letter. He left a letter saying like, "Your dad made me do it." Well, <laughs> like he doesn't want us to be together because I'm not rich. Yeah. So she's like, "Oh, he does love me," and puts on. Yes, love and- that ghost line. Still actually like the ghost line. Yep. <laughs> so she, you know, that one ghost. very, very improperly, she just throws on her coat and runs off to his hotel, hope, hoping to catch him before he's left. He's gone. And she does, of course, because, of course, he's waiting there for her and they they kiss and he's like, oh, I want you to marry me or whatever. I, I don't know. <laughs> and then, like, five seconds later, like, they walk down the hallway and she and the fucking her fucking dad's lawyer is like, oh, your dad's dead. And, and like, you dad, dad totally fucking ate it. I don't know what happened. Yeah, it's so normal to have like, <laughs> you know, it's so normal when the guy that your dad definitely didn't want you to marry uh, is suddenly able to marry you because your dad is fucking murdered. Uh, because your dad well, you fell know. into the sink ten times. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, fell um, really hard so many times that there's blood everywhere, and his skull is caved in like in a couple spots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, again. I like D made a good point. Like, yeah, sure. At this point in time, no one's investigating like every murder, but this was a prominent member of Buffalo High Society, a very wealthy man who was building stuff for people. He was well known and died under very mysterious circumstances. And and Alan, the the ophthalmologist, you know, the guy who like thinks he's the hero. He's like, yeah, he's yeah. like, uh, hey, everyone, this looks really suspicious. And everyone's like, no, nah, it's fine. And Alan, I just everyone was like, shut the fuck up, Alan. Every <laughs> fucking time, Alan. I know, poor Alan. It's, it's like even better because Edith's dad makes no mystery that he hates the Sharps possibly more than anything at that exact moment in time. Like, he's oh, yeah. actually, like, you get the impression that he's tripping around Buffalo, New York, just going, like, hey, have you seen that Thomas Sharp fellow? I hate his fucking guts. <laughs> so it's just like, yeah. and then he, and then that, that same man absconds with his daughter, like, days after he dies. No, the Alan's day he going, dies. Like, Wait, I'm a doctor. This is, <laughs> yeah, this yeah, is like, a murder. <laughs> yeah, like, this is- Whatever, you just know eyes. You're an eye doctor. You're not a body doctor. <laughs> yeah, but his Do eyes you know? were some of the <laughs> But his <laughs> eyes were some of the things that were crushed horribly. <laughs> this isn't what eyes are supposed to look like. I know, I'm a doctor. Yeah, I'm a doctor. 
They don't All right. fall out normally. All right, it, is, also- it is worth noting at this point in American history and even today in a lot of states, to be a coroner, you don't need to have any medical training whatsoever. Oh, I know. The coroner, yeah. that like epidemic of coroners. <laughs> like uh, fucking last week tonight did a great piece on the problem with coroners in the United States. Anyway, this is this is a sidebar. But um, so can we talk about how unrealistic the actual murder of Mr. Cushing is? Because oh. I don't believe it for a fucking hot second. Are you so, are you telling me that a frail British woman cannot easily overpower a monstrously huge American businessman? A, a frail well, a woman that the book later confirms is like canonically malnourished. <laughs> yeah, and also yeah, right, right, right. So so the book likes to mention that Lucille has like super strength all the time, and I'm like, okay, what are you basing this on? Like, you can't just bitch, say that. She's a huge bitch. It just makes her stronger. Yeah, just the power, the power of the cuntiness just just inspires her. Um, so yeah, so the whole the whole murder, like Cushing, Mr. Cushing is killed when he is in his uh health club bathroom? Question mark. Right, he yeah. was at like the spa, like the. Yeah, like the rich guy club. And the rich guy club has this this really nice bathroom. But Cushing likes to get there really early every morning. And that's fine. He has like uh he has music on, he has a record player in there. And there's a servant at the beginning that helps him get his shaving stuff together and he's like, Hey, I think I will I'll have some breakfast, you know. The servant's like, Alright, cool, I'll go get that breakfast. While the servant is gone, Lucille somehow sneaks into this fancy gentleman's club bathroom <laughs> and murders uh, the dad by smashing his head repeatedly into a porcelain sink so hard that she breaks the sink and just sinks his entire face in. And I just, I don't believe any of it. There's just well, no there's, way. There's so many variables, which is like, yeah, how did exactly. she get in? Well, that like it established that there were po- probably I'm guessing that that one servant wasn't the only guy working right, that right. day. Right. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> and also, I don't think people regularly get beaten to death in your bathroom, and you might actually stop and go, "Huh? Not the usual noise." Well, yeah, and well, and the the more curious thing is like, she would have to have been extremely well disguised as a man to have gotten in there because you, <laughs> they wouldn't have let women into the gentlemen's club, and like I know. In the movie, they make pains to to show you that she's wearing like men's men's pants and stuff, but she's not wearing any prosthetics or like a mask. She's still like, Ava Green, like <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty stupid. So I just don't buy she's that. Not home. Eva Green, D. Oh my god, I got she's all my. She's wicked. Not, she's not Eva Green. Wait, who's no. the actress that played Lucille? Jessica not Chastain. <laughs> Jessica, Jessica Chastain. Chastain. I get my yes. sharp faced hot women mixed. And up. to be fair, Jessica Chastain does have the jawline to pull it off. But yeah. I mean, she's like a lady. And, and anyway. also, at this point, cross-dressing was such a new concept to straight people that you could basically just put on a fake mustache and a suit jacket and no one would notice. It was <laughs> extremely easy to get away with cross-dressing back in the day because it just never occurred to straight uh, people. I mean, I just, yeah, the whole the whole murder doesn't make any sense. I, I think that someone could have, I think that Cushing could have been surprised, maybe, but I don't think he could have been just straight up face crushed in murdered like that. I just, especially since right when he's getting his head smashed in, he's holding a straight razor in his hand. <laughs> yeah. And that he I, doesn't I, use to defend himself. The, the book does love the use of internal dialogue. Uh, so I was kind of hoping it would cut to him going like, oh, dag, I, I, get, oh, I wish I could figure out uh, this razor's useless. <laughs> I, can't, I can't save myself with this. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> my breakfast! So, where's my breakfast? That would help! <laughs> if only so, I had the most important meal of the day! <laughs> I'd be able to so overpower weak. this malnourished British woman! <laughs> In this slippery environment, because the shower, the water, it was like full of the, the sink was overflowing and the bathroom was like full of water too. So. Yeah, and he'd, and he'd oiled himself. So. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had taken my morning grease. <laughs> Grease me, Jeeves. I want to be as slippery as possible. That's what I have to get the ham for, sir. I'll be right back. Uh, <laughs> you can, I can grease you, then you can have it after. Oh, what? Capital, capital. I hope nobody bashes my head in, because I would be far too slippery to defend myself. <laughs> 
I think we solved the murder, you guys. <laughs> So I'm just picturing just like Alan McMichael going through this whole routine in front of a courtroom to yeah. explain how yeah, yeah. how he got murdered. Like, yeah. dude. So anyway, I know. No, we've been I still on think about he this. just slipped. I mean, you know, those I, sinks are right there all the time, I, right? Like, he I know slipped we, and fell into the sink twelve twelve times. times. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know we've been on about this, but it really makes no goddamn it's sense. It's really crazy. And and so poor Alan is like, but guys. It's definitely murder and everyone's like nah he's like no 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 <laughs> but like half. For he's like, hogging he's... the only brain cell in the book <laughs> <laughs> also the only attractive man cell in the movie <laughs> I mean they're explicitly Excuse really you, Mr. Holly's a dream boat yeah I would fuck Mr. Holly <laughs> what you ever, you ever get, no. I would get so horny for Mr. Holly that I forgot the dire warning of my dead mother <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> Does he, does it, d- did the actor do it for you when he was in Game of Thrones drinking blood out of a skull too? Because he totally... <laughs> I, I, did he do that? I didn't watch Game of Thrones. He he was like a knife fighter mutineer from the the Night's Watch that Jon Snow has to murder. That sounds pretty hot, to be completely honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll go find the clip and see if it's still hot. <laughs> I also want to say that like Alan is very like explicitly set up as like the real guy, nice guy that you really should have went with Edith. Here's yeah. this beautiful nice doctor here and you're going off with the, the British Chad to his <laughs> house that's taller than everyone else's. So what I'm hearing is that Sir Thomas Sharp wears short skirts and Alan McMichael wears t-shirts yes, and Sir exactly. Thomas Sharp is cheer captain and Alan McMichael is on the bleachers? Yeah, yeah. Yes, exa- exactly. <laughs> but like it's so overbearing with like the Alan's the right choice. Alan's the one you should have gone with. You, can you should have listened to your father. blonde. Yeah. yeah, seriously. Like, I just hate how fucking heavy-handed all of this shit is. It's yeah. like, you don't even have to be paying attention. You could be partially comatose and still understand everything in this book because it just smacks you over the face repeatedly with like, oh, this is a metaphor. Oh, you know what? The blonde people are the heroes and the black-haired people are the bad ones. And like, <laughs> butterflies and moths and ghosts. Oh my everything god. Everything is red. Off. Everything is red. I, I tried uh. to keep track of the number of times that the book did two things, which was mention that Edith is a writer, which, yeah, when she wrote the book, I actually didn't need too much more reminding. Nope. But it does keep going on to remind me that she does, in fact, write. And when it continually tips its use of moths and butterflies as a metaphor to me and goes like, eh? Eh? It's even I'm doing still that. doing it. The moths it's, are still here. <laughs> it's even doing that with ghosts, with, like, her, Edith, in fiction, having to say, oh, the ghosts are a metaphor, which, <laughs> which I feel like is what they're trying to sell with the ghosts in this story, because you don't even really need the ghosts here. <laughs> What are they it's, a metaphor for? What are they helping it's not, with? It's not a ghost story. It's a story with ghosts in it. <laughs> then Audience, you don't need them. Are you Get listening? rid of them. Get rid of them. You don't even need them. <laughs> get the anything. ghosts out. But if we get the ghosts out, why did we bother hiring this mime to dress up in Victorian clothing? <laughs> I don't know, but like you can do this whole story without any of the ghost stuff. You can literally do zero. Like, there's nothing that could get affected. Yeah, but Doug Jones needs to feed his family. All right, sure. <laughs> oh, Doug Jones. He can't I don't know. Do a Casper TV special. I don't care. Like, <laughs> Ooh, it so, is. So it's good. Have we even gone to fucking England yet? No, we haven't. No. We're still in Buffalo. Oh, guys, guys, I got a Friday night to have. Like, let's fucking, let's fucking keep right. going. Do you want to make this a two-parter? Oh, no, God, we gotta get this over with. No, yeah. please, 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 guys, please, I have to no. edit this before I leave no. for Japan, so... <laughs> Okay, that's the other. All right, the other. <laughs> the other night when Chris and I watched the movie for patrons, afterward it was late, but I still like had to cleanse my palate, so I watched like a mountaineering documentary before bed because <laughs> it was just like the furthest thing I like <laughs> from from like what we were talking about. So <laughs> watching like, people climb a peak was the furthest thing from Crimson Peak. Yes, <laughs> because it's. It's modern people using spiky things to get up a big, tall, dangerous thing. And no one is in love with anyone. And it's it's just (laughs) snowy and beautiful. They're all in love with the mountain. Exactly. (laughs) 
It's a it's a special relationship that human love can't even get close to. It's not a story about a mountain. It's a story with a mountain in it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh. we're off to England now. We're off to England across the sea all right, all right, to well, the so shitty let's, hall. Well, let's let's explain that the fucking so... hole in the roof that no one covers. <laughs> Yeah, we can talk about that in a moment. So, oh um, God, yeah, the roof, the, the hole in the, the roof, roof, full of falling leaves from the trees that aren't there. Yeah, because yeah. So, no all right, all right, trees. fucking, fucking, hold the fuck on, everybody. All right, so let's explain. All right, so the very, the very same day that Edith's father is murdered slash just dies because no one wants to think that he's murdered, she uh, starts. You know, she decides she's going to marry Thomas Sharp. Uh, they get married. We don't see the wedding. Uh, and then she just goes to England and selling off all of her, her father's estate, all of her shit. Literally everything is for sale. It's just a big fucking yard sale in Buffalo, New York, all of the Cushing shit out on the lawn. And by the way, she leaves and just leaves Alan and the lawyer to deal with everything. (laughs) It's your problem now. Bye. Yeah. And (laughs) so, so yeah, we get to, we get to England and as she's, riding up to Allerdale Hall, you know, and it's a it's a white snowy peak with red shit seeping out of it. Doesn't occur to her that it's fucking Crimson Peak. Um also Ghost Mom came back to warn her uh right before the Thomas a thing. Second time. A yeah. second time her mom was like, bitch, I I can see you thirsting, but for fucking real this time. <laughs> I told you before, I had to come straight from hell once again. Do you know how hard it is to get a day pass out of that place? The traffic. Eat it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... So anyway. They, uh... She gets there, and this is this is where the haunt begins. You know, like, the real... This is where the, the romance ends and the horror begins, I guess. Uh... Oh, the and, romance never ends. Yeah, and so yeah, as Chris, so the most significant feature about Crimson about Allerdale Hall, Crimson Peak, is this giant fucking hole in the roof that no one covers, <laughs> and as Ken pointed out, has leaves coming in coming into it that from trees that aren't there. So I don't know, I don't know what's going on. They have like a groundskeeper that greets them at the front. He's like, "Yeah, I've been here keeping it up." It's like, "No, you fucking haven't, dude." I- <laughs> he also explicitly has Alzheimer's. <laughs> well, yeah, they only have one servant left, Chris, for the entire okay, property. Sure, and but like, pouring can- all of the money into the murder machine that kills no one. He's not. He can. He can survive on his own. He's not like so dementiaed out that he can't like you know go about his business and do. He can ask someone maybe at one point of lucidity to, hey, could you get someone to fix this roof for me? I, I'll use the Lord, uh, Sir Thomas's money to do this. I'd assume he'd want this fixed. <laughs> You'd assume wrong, sir. Like, <laughs> did they invest right. in the machine? The machine. All right. Hey, hey, guys, though, like, it's 1901. Do we not have tarps? No Are tarps. Are tarps no. not a thing? Tarp. No. Nope. Tarp- the circus took them all. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that you could whack some fucking fabric or put a leather tarp up there, and you know what? You then you don't have snow in the house. Fabric, however, the circus yeah. has taken all of our canvas. You know, you don't you don't have snow in the house. You don't have leaves in the house. You don't have fucking rain in the house. Like, it just but boggles less. the goddamn mind. It's Barnum and Bailey. <laughs> it, it's it, it's very much the spirit of that one drill tweet where it's like, "Please help me budget. My family is dying. I spent two thousand dollars on candles." Yeah, <laughs> like, there's definitely a hole in our roof, but I do keep funneling money into the machine. Yeah, like I just that kills me. That just for practicality's sake, I just don't get it. Um, Fortunately, it's the only plot hole in this book. Oh so. yeah, oh Everything definitely the tight. only one. We haven't already <laughs> talked about like four, but it's fine. Um, so I, I mean, obviously, it w- it's there as a metaphor, but there's too many metaphors in this movie. I don't need them all. I don't. Stop guiding me. Just let me free. Let my imagination work. Let my mind do something. No, Stop. there's moths. Did I tell you about the moths? Oh, God. The moths. <laughs> was, uh... Also, can no, I... moths. I want to say, like, part of the book to movie thing that happened here is when I was reading the book, I actually found Lucille fairly like, oh, she's like kind of conniving and she's trying to like be secretive about these things. In the movie, she, Jessica Chast- Chastain acts this out like every single line she delivers is evil. It's the most evil way. <laughs> 
you could say the line. So the book allowed me the leeway to interpret things as like, oh, she's just saying this like a normal person would. That's how I'm assuming she's saying this. But in the movie, even down to like, yes, did you enjoy your tea? The tea. <laughs> He did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jessica Chastain overacts the shit out of this role. It's, it's absurd. Beautiful. It's a work of fucking. I art. think Jessica Chastain was acting to scale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not her fault that the story is dumb as fuck. Like, you know, she she did a good it's, job. It's not her fault that Del Toro set out all this delicious scenery for her to chew. Uh, like- dude, the scenery. I gotta say, like, fuck the story, but. All right, just like the the fish sex one, like fuck the story, but it's great to watch. Like, yeah, it's right? beautiful. They're beautiful films. It's a yeah, visual beautiful. feast. It makes no goddamn sense, but it's so fucking pretty. Yeah, and yeah. She dude. fucks the fish man, so like, good. No, I hate. All right, do we really want to get into my diatribe about consent? No, after I saw that no, movie, okay, that's a all separate right. thing. That's like, a separate thing. I mean, I am curious to hear about it, but we'll we'll shelf that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is that'll be a, a special. We just got segment. to England. We, we only just got to England. Please. Oh, God. All right, all right. There's a fucking dog now. Hey, and guess what kind of dog it is? Guess what kind of fucking dog it is? It's a papillon. Is it a papillon? It's a papillon, which <laughs> means papillon. fucking butterfly. Because we just can't stop. We can't stop <laughs> ourselves. The symbolism. The uh, symbology oh, it's so rich. <laughs> want to be dead. Also, the ball that the dog has is red because red everything. Do you yes, get it? it's a metaphor. Do you get it yet? Everything having to do with ghosts in the film is color coded red. Do you understand? That? So I hate to be a bigger part of the problem, but so like, there's something that really bothered me about the dog subplot. Yeah. Uh, everyone reacts with uh, with like this really genuine shock when the dog shows up, but there's a line where. Uh, the the book is just like, oh, why is the dog here? I thought it was dead. And he's like, I left it outside. And it's like a two-day walk from town, so it should have been dead. And, yeah, and dogs like, can't walk for more than, like, four I, yeah, hours, like, and you know. Two days isn't that, like, I know that they're, like, malnourished, feeble English orphans. But, like, <laughs> it's Mal- not that long. Malnourished, Wait. feeble English orphans who didn't leave the house until they murdered their mother. Like, they're not firing on all cylinders. <laughs> Hold on no, a second. No, so wait, 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 I need to parse this line again, hearing it for a sec again for a second, because so Thomas leaves it outside, outdoors, yeah. and he's like, "Oh, the dog will die because it can't get to town to I don't know buy food because that's what <laughs> yeah. dogs do, right?" Yeah, well, I think absolutely. I think he was. I think he was thinking. Money. I think he was thinking that the dog is small. It is winter time. It'll probably die due to exposure. Yeah, which, but the line uh, seems to insinuate that, like, oh, it can't get to town, therefore it will die. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, very, it heavily yeah. leans on the distance from town. Right, Listen, right. This is a man who thinks you mine clay by putting it back into the ground. Like he's not. <laughs> he's not really anything approaching genius. All right, all right. All right hang on though. So, um. So, all right, so so he's like, oh, I don't know, I left it outside, I thought it would die. Like, motherfucker, you're gonna tell me this house with a huge-ass hole in the roof doesn't have holes in the side of it, too? Like, I'm sure that dog was going in and out of that house through uh, all sorts of entries. How the dog possibly gotten back in? <laughs> yeah, like, this house is a mess. Anyone there's can like walk in and There's, like, bugs all over the place, too. Like, assumably there's a raccoon somewhere hanging, or I don't know if, if raccoons are in England, but... Also, there's, like, mine shafts that go directly outside into the basement, and then from the basement you can get up into the house. So, like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. house so bad, you guys. Like, dogs aren't Why that did they stupid. Build the house? <laughs> Why did they build the mansion on top of... Of the clay the mine. The Sharps didn't know that you didn't have to build your house on build it, onto your business. Build it two feet to the left. They saw they saw Taylor that lived in in like above his shop, and they were like, "Oh, that's how you do business." <laughs> <laughs> wow. Also, they have like vats of clay down there that I don't know. They're just hanging on to. Why don't they sell the clay that they have <laughs> for the money? I think that's. I think that's the point of the, the vats is to collect it. To I don't. I don't fucking know. I'm not a clay miner. <laughs> they're all I don't full. Know. Like they're not selling the clay. Like should they be selling the stock there minimally? Now, now yeah, is, you would think. Are the vats full because they have so much clay in them, or are they full because all the corpses are pushing the clay to the surface? I, you know, still either clay. or. <laughs> you can still, still get still some clay. of the clay out. Also, like, if they were smart, 
they would grind up the bodies and just throw it in the clay and there would be literally no evidence instead of just throwing the bodies <laughs> whole into the clay vats <laughs> but for they someone destroy to any find. Evidence. This is a yeah. noted sharp way to get away with murder is to leave all evidence lying around the house. <laughs> oh, just put it behind a single caught. door. Put it to behind a single point, door. They have never been caught. I understand I it. That's like another problem. <laughs> All right, we got we got we got to reel it in, guys. All right, so anyway, she gets to England. There's a dog. Turns, you know, the dog is of course, you know, a fucking leftover from the last wife or whatever. And Lucille wants it to die, but you know, now Edith has it, and Thomas is like, eh, "It's fine, Edith. She'll be dead soon anyway." So of course, they start her on the routine of poison tea. Uh, Edith sees some more ghosts. Then the ghosts eventually. Uh, oh, then she takes the elevator to the basement and finds more evidence that they just leave literally lying around. She you finds know, the t- wax cylinders in a linen closet oh, first. Yeah. Like, no one checked <laughs> to see what these recordings were. Just, like, an elaborate confession of, like, hey, get the fuck out. They've, they've been poisoning me. They're yeah, not going to get rid of that? <laughs> Dude, that's the other thing. That's, like, another part of this this book that I was like, wow, really? You're not you're not going to make anyone try for anything in this book at all. Just all served to you, hot and steaming on a silver <laughs> platter, already cut better. into bite-sized pieces. Like, do you want me to chew it for you, too? Fucking Christ. She's, but the thing is, Edith still needs help. Yeah, she, even after <laughs> like, the cylinders. Still, it's all out in the fucking open, and is the ghost that- still needs to pop up and be like, Get, seriously, in the fucking closet. Open the closet. <laughs> you live here. Get in the closet. <laughs> and the other ghost is like, Edith! Fucking leave! And she's like, I don't know, what should I do? (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. So, okay, was the book written assuming the audience was as stupid as Edith? Yes. Yes. That's the only way that it makes any sense. Because it's all just so... Every point is driven home at least three times within the same paragraph. It is infuriating. Yeah, like, Guillermo del Toro is a mother bird... Just, just gonna, he's just gonna puke it all up, already chewed, ready for you to digest into your mouth, and that is that's what you're gonna do, and you're gonna like it because this movie looks nice, and that's 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 how and he's right, working. and he's right, and he's right, like <laughs> no, he's wrong, he's correct. I open no. my mouth and I say, please, more, Daddy Del Toro. <laughs> And so then you sincerely regret having said those words in sequence into a microphone. Yeah, and it's yeah. forever now. So that's cool. Uh, oh, dude, I've done that. I've done that so many times. It's fine. Um, I, I've said. I've said some. Some. There are some sound bites of me out there from this podcast that. Oof, yikes. Um, if I cared about my my like public image, I would be concerned. But I don't. So fuck it. Uh, yeah. So anyway, all these like various dead women ghosts are like. You're gonna die too. Like their their dead mom ghost is there. Um, all the wives. Anyway, yeah, Edith. Edith, like like we're saying, some pieces this together over a period of question mark weeks, days. No one knows. In the book, Hours. yeah. In the book, it's made very clear that she is getting very ill due to the poison. Like. Constant nausea, dizziness, confusion. In the movie, she is not sick at all until the very end. And even then, it doesn't seem that bad. In the book, though, I think this is one of the reasons I think the book does. It's like one of the things that the book does better is like it's pretty clear that she's she's disoriented, and maybe that's why she needs so much help in piecing she was things together. Before she went to oh, England. I know, I know, yeah. she was stupid beforehand, but. <laughs> My yeah. favorite part in the book is when she actively notices that she's getting sick and the other two aren't, and then, like, immediately stops thinking about it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, oh, that's weird. I've been, like, it. vomiting blood and I can't think. And Thomas and Lucille ate all the same shit and they're fine. Also, they seem ah. like really, he seemed to really care which tea tin I used. Hmm. <laughs> really, really specific about the tea, so, like, I should probably not worry about that. Also, there's maybe an opportunity here to tie in, like, oh, maybe the ghosts she's seeing aren't really real, and she's having these delirium moments because right, she's so right. sick or anything. But that's not even a thing at all either. No. So it just totally renders the ghosts useless. All they're there for is to just point her towards the next plot point to find out, like, that's look, that's where the wax cylinders are. Here's where the corpses are. Also, please leave. Like, they're just begging her to get on with the story. <laughs> okay, okay, now get dude, out, yes, please. Dude, this is like, all right. So I, I went to a uh, a haunted house on Sunday. Uh, I've never done that before, and it didn't seem appealing to me. But a bunch of my friends and bandmates were going, so I went. And that's what this is like. It's like when you're in the haunted house and you're really blind because they're like strobing or there's no lights, 
and you walk into one of the actors and they're like to the right and you're like oh you broke character but thank you like like that's <laughs> all that like 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 there was another part when we were we were outside and there was a a white there was this woman this ghostly woman in white standing by a door and so we thought we were like oh so we go into the door of that house but then as we walk up she was like no to the left and we were like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like and i felt like that's what this that's all these ghosts were and they were just like you 100%. said you know just They're- pointing her in the direction of the nearest clue and honestly without these ghosts what would have happened to edith she, she would died. have died very she quickly died, <laughs> she would have died yeah. like very quickly. Oh god! Yeah, and then, and so, then everything is just so fucking cliche. Every ounce of this is so cliche and gross, and I fucking hate it. You don't have to work for anything. It drives me insane. There's so much romance, which I, you know, we all hate. I hate love. It's terrible. Get it out of here. <laughs> uh, it's not even no. good romance. It's just like, well, no. she likes him because he read the thing and complimented her once. Also, yeah, right. Like I was thinking, and I was like, I was like thinking back to you know. uh a, per- a person I may have d- developed some kind of affection for. And I'm like, wow, that, no, it took way more than that. Like, g- <laughs> like Jesus Christ. Yeah, like. You gotta do, s- do a little something, spend a little time with somebody. My God, like. You can't I have to, I, I have to get this on my chest because you guys brought up the, the, the specific teacup. It infuriates me that they refer to it as, this is like such a fucking, but like you, you guys are talking to us, so you had to exper- like expect a little bit of this. It's not fucking cloisonné. I did make a note to ask you about that because I was looking at that cup and I'm like, I don't think that's cloisonné. It says cloisonné like 12 times. Yo, it's yo, and, yo, antiques freaks. What the fuck are you saying? <laughs> so, like, cloisonné is enameled metal and the two things you may have noticed about that is that it doesn't make, like, a good drinking cup. Or at uh, least no, not because a good it would burn your cup. face and hands. It makes a pretty... <laughs> it makes a pretty awful... Like, it makes a bad cup in general, but it's an even worse porcelain cup. And it's... <laughs> Still worse, because clearly the author threw in cloisonne to sound fancy. They did, yeah. When they could have just said bone china and made it thematic. Yeah, that would have made a lot more sense. And I know that because I listen to your show. And I listen oh, to the bone you. china episode. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Although thank I you. didn't I didn't remember what cloisonne was. I don't know if you've covered that on the show. But I actually have. do have an episode on cloisonne. Uh, God um, damn it, it doesn't make teacups crazy. No, You don't want to no. eat tea drink out of brass. It tastes bad. And it burns yeah. you. <laughs> It's and it ah, for anyone who cares. The tea set in the movie is Bone China Royal Crown Derby pattern. I know no one cares, but I care. (laughs) No, 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 I care. It's Uh, Royal Crown Derby. It's it's a it's an English copy of older Nippon, and and fuck them for calling it closing (laughs) it. I've just Uh, been sitting here thinking about how Bone China sounds like a Halloween themed version of China. Listen, okay, it is porcelain that they grind actual bones into yeah it's pretty fucking metal and rad i was antiques are to be clear i'm talking about the country of china not like tea sets that are like halloween themed i'm talking about like if china for like what the entire month of october it was just (laughs) all skeleton china yeah yes Uh. all right guys my first beer is finally gone oh i I was (laughs) oh my god it's three deep by now i'm actually impressed if oh we're shit! Still the, if we're still doing the podcast by the time she gets to the third beer, we're all dead. Yeah, Dude, true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I have, <laughs> like I said, I have a fucking Friday night to have. Like I got, I, I need a couple hours not talking about fucking Crimson Peak this week. Oh, I'm so, just now realizing that you may be hearing Merciful Fate bass being played again. So sorry about that. It's coming from downstairs. It's all right. <laughs> We've got, got some people in this house doing some covers for Halloween, so... Well. I guess we should kind of spirit along towards, like, the ending of the book now, because the, we got through the meat of, like, oh, she goes to England and the ghosts point her at all the clues that the sharps just leave out there. They're not the even, like, burying it. Do the it, ghost or... point her to the fucking, uh, lullaby dick dick touching scene, or is that, like... <laughs> lullaby dick dick. <laughs> what? My favorite... <laughs> Song, <laughs> lullaby, dick, dick. I don't want to sing the rest of the song now. No, I've thrown no. myself into the deep end, and now I'm exiting. No, no, so, I, yeah, I, yeah, I no, can't The ghost remember. points the fingers like, check out what's behind that door. It's super gross. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so and she so opens like, the door, and it is, yeah, no, it's a lullaby dick touch. Yep. Although I don't think in the book they, uh, I don't know if. I don't know if the book... They do not specify any genital contact in the text, no. But yeah. it is extremely specific in the film. It's implied in the book because she claims to have had the Thomas's baby. So you're like, oh, she touched his dick at some point. 
But for some reason, they're very tender about it in the book. Although she's yeah. like actively cranking his hog in the movie. Yeah. So I don't know what <laughs> made them... <laughs> I'm gonna tell you okay, something okay. funny, Chris. No, I Chris, funny. I have to know. <laughs> yes. As someone who has not seen the film, uh huh, were you surprised by the incest? No, I mean I knew they were fucking like immediately because of how everything was fed <laughs> to like. She like the whole during the whole book, it, Lucille is like, "Did you sleep? Were you together? Did you do what? What happened? Why were you alone with her?" I'm like, "Oh, so she's like." Did, They've been fucking, right? Like, that's what this is. <laughs> right, right. Okay, because, like, I went into the film being like, all right, they're either vampires or they're gay or they're gay vampires. These are the only three options for this plot to resolve. And then suddenly oh, incest dick slapped me in the face. And I was like, what? <laughs> I actually think Casey and I called the incest thing. Every Everyone everyone I have talked to who has seen this film called the incest. I, I think, the I think that for me, it was they're either gay or incest. Well, I think the I think the scene that really sells it, if you've seen the book, uh, if you've seen the book, uh, if you've seen, <laughs> seen the, it, yes, sorry, I've seen if you, this book. Excuse me, if you've seen the movie, the kitchen scene, the breakfast scene is the one that really Jessica Chastain makes it real obvious that she is pissed that he put his dick in her. Like, oh. I mean, she throws potatoes all over the kitchen. Like, she's like crying. No, it's, she didn't know he fucked her until but until like the moment I, she murders him. No, okay, I thought that. I thought I had assumed that she was upset because he had left her all alone in the house and they were under like some curse where they had to be together at all times because they're both ghosts, vampires and or gay. OK, yeah, I, I mean, I think that was, like, I, I, a I, cool supernatural explanation, but in the end it was only incest. Yeah. anyway. So so, yeah, so the big reveal hmm. for, you know, in the in the film and in the book is the ghost is like, look behind that door. And she looks and, you know, and uh, Lucille and Thomas are in there childhood attic bedroom and uh lucille is singing him a lullaby while she is jerking him off real hard like like he was saying (laughs) and so the funny part for me was the first time i saw this film i totally missed the jerking off part (laughs) (laughs) what i think that i was just focusing on their faces and the singing and I think it's Did because you, you missed Jessica Chastain jerking off Tom Hiddleston. Yeah, like real good. I totally missed it. Like I knew that they were obviously in an intim- they were having some sort of intimacy, but I didn't. I don't know. My mind. I think it was because she was singing because I'm a stupid musician and a singer, and I just focus on that stuff. And I was like, oh, she's singing to him. And then like the scene cut away, and everyone was like, haha, she was totally jerking him off. And I was like, what? <laughs> I just like. <laughs> and then and then on the rewatch. Wait. wait so and then you on the rewatch. You, wait. You thought Edith walked in the room and saw the, the Lady Sharp singing to Thomas Sharp, and that's what like unraveled it all? No, no, no. They were. I mean, they were obviously in an intimate embrace. Like he was kissing her shoulder. She, you know, her, her. She was in her dress clothes or whatever. But um, no. And then on the rewatch, I was like, "Wow, how did I fucking miss that? Holy <laughs> shit, she's going to town down there. Like that's like that's intense." Um. Anyway, and then of course, like. Once that happens, that sets off, you know, they got to they got to kill her right away, even though she's really sick. Um, and that, that sets off the ending chase scene in the film. So, you know, Edith knows at this point that, you know, she's found the, the wax cylinders that literally lay everything out for her. All the pre- <laughs> like who was letting the previous wives record this stuff? Like if it was one of them, it would have been one thing, but it was like all of them. <laughs> I, I didn't understand that. I was like, it is like, one of them in the film. It is all of them in the book. Yeah, which yeah, is and baffling. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, and I'm just like, who is like, okay, this is fine, you know. And anyway, so she has everything given to her by ghosts, whether ghosts in a ghostly way or literally, like, listen to these audio recordings that are going to tell you what's going on right now, um, you know. And then she she comes upon them upstairs, but she's really ill at this point. She's very very sick from the poison, so she's kind of like struggling. And um, even at this point, Edith is still so fucking dumb that <laughs> Lucille comes after her and she and Edith is like, I knew you weren't his sister. You're his wife. And Lucille is like, that's hilarious. No, I'm definitely his <laughs> sister and pushes her off the fucking banister. Legitimately my favorite part of the film. <laughs> I was just um, like, is, is setting up that potential twist and then immediately squashing it. Like, God, just like, Edith, like. <laughs> God, Edith, I don't know how else to help you, dude. Like, I, 
<laughs> you think that you think they cut a section where there's a ghost in the background just slapping its hand against its forehead? Like, <laughs> yeah, like fuck. I don't know what to do anymore. <laughs> like all the ghosts commit ritual ghost suicide. Where like they don't even exist on that plane anymore. They're like, you know what? We can't even be fucking useful here. Off to hell. I can't. Like, I can't. Like, we that's just, it. Like, we just showed her. Showed her the them cranking each other's hogs, and she's just like, oh, I figured it all out. They're married. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem, Edith. It's just too fucking pure. I'm glad for this she threw you off world. a fucking balcony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's an, here's another like weird part of the thing that's like kind of a plot hole, not really believable. Is uh, Crimson Peak is a three story plus basement home, and we're talking. I mean, stories are this is a big story. This isn't like your and, you know seven foot tall American. Oh yeah, no, this- Home. These this are is like, vaulted ceilings. Yeah, these are like eleven plus feet tall, right? So these are these are some big stories. So she pushes Edith from the attic. So that's actually technically the fifth story, right? If we're counting the basement, I think so. Pushes, yeah, but she doesn't pushes, fall all the way to the basement. That's true. She, she falls to the banister. Not the that way. Looney Tunes. Yeah, she about falls it. four stories, hitting a wooden banister and just crushing it on the way down. And falls on the pile of snow that is conveniently there. Thank you, hole It's not even a roof. thick pile of snow, by the way. Just to clarify, it's like no. an inch or two, no, maybe? No, but the, but the clay lot. underneath it is so soft. Yeah, that's, yeah. One, that's one thing I've noticed about clay, is how soft it's it is. It's wet, muddy clay, and it <laughs> saved her life. Did Do you, you think that's the, the, the other thing that, like... Thomas Sharp was trying to sell his clay and it was just like soft and shitty the whole time because he was too <laughs> stupid to understand. And that's like, it's the only explanation. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so Edith gets thrown four stories, hits a fucking banister and, on the way down. And it breaks her fall. Some, somehow, she hit terminal velocity. Yeah. She's somehow. <laughs> and, okay. And this is in addition to being severely poisoned. And somehow. Oh, and she's fi- she's kind of fine. She's alive, and also Alan just appears from the snowstorm, Surprise, just waltzes I'm here in the now. house. Like and they also, also, I am here. <laughs> also, here's here's the thing. Here's the, here's my question. Like, actually, Chris, I think I should give you credit for this because I think this is what you said when we were watching the film. Is like there, so they have just pushed Edith to her death, presumably. And then the doorbell rings, and they're like, well, I guess we gotta get it. And it's I like, guess, yeah. no, I mean, you don't. Have to answer you it. don't have to answer the fucking door. Like, what do you think we are, animals? <laughs> Stop screaming, Edith. I'm still a baronet. I have my manners, please. <laughs> yeah, like, I just don't understand that. Like, they could have ignored the door, first of all. And even if someone, and like, if somebody did, so anyway, they let Helen in, and, and they're like, oh, you know what good timing she just had a fall and she's so ill and blah <laughs> and so you know he he bandages her, bandages her up but he knows what's up because he also talked to mr holly and like got the got the you know the info on these fuckers and uh traveled there you know of course with perfect timing to show up literally at the fucking 11th hour <laughs> I think they say that in the book too oh god it's so fucking stupid i, I think it actually in those exact words describes him as the hero of the 11th hour oh god i guess <laughs> i know <laughs> sure because like god forbid i have to use my brain for four minutes yeah and and so like alan you know in his oh god not even alan can be smart not even the smartest person <laughs> in this whole story can be smart so like he, no you see, know, the smart thing to do in this situation is to tell the murderers to their exactly. Yep. You know yep. that they're murderers, and your intention as soon as you leave their house with their latest victim is to tell everyone. And yes, say is... it immediately after thinking to yourself, "Oh, I shouldn't do that." <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> this is what I was building to. Um, makes no sense. And so naturally, maybe there's like the red clay is like stupefying somehow, like the mist <laughs> that it gives, like Perhaps. particles. God, is this I just, think is it carbon monoxide poisoning? No, I think the book alludes to the fact that he made like his first like dumb st- like he caught a bad case of the stupid bitch disease, <laughs> yeah. and he was like, "Oh, I know what'll help. What if I walk through a snowstorm for like ten miles?" And then he gets there and he's like, "Ah, shit, I'm wicked tired." <laughs> Dude, it wasn't even that long. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even that many miles, but anyway. No, but he's, he's It was so only like weak. four. He's like it's a like, pampered doctor. He's like, oh, I've never used my legs before. <laughs> and they wouldn't give me a horse. <laughs> oh, yeah. I also love when they're at the post office and they're like, we're closing for the winter. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, like the post office. Uh, also, the post office hotel. Did you like the post office with a hotel room <laughs> in it? 
I was I'm going like, home for six months. Don't speak to me. Yeah, I was like, so bo- uh, both of those things have historical precedent, but yes. Oh, shit, really? Wait, wait, we got Listen, post office hotels? winters are fucking brutal up there. Yo, we live in New England. We got some new brutal winters over here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, just end my suffering, please. That was one of the weird things that the book, uh, like, seems to have, like, bafflingly cut from the movie. Because if I'm recalling correctly, the movie has... Alan tells the people at the depot, Alright, you guys gotta follow me. In the book, yeah. Yeah. No, he doesn't do that in the book. He does in the book. Wait, when did I miss that? Because in my impression... When when they won't give him, like, a horse or a ride, he's like, Okay, well, I'm going anyway, just so you all know. By the way, I met a dude on the... (laughs) Chip that I also told I was going here, and he's probably right behind me, conveniently. Anyway, that, no, goodbye. no, like... Oh, yeah, ship no, guy like, doesn't the, exist! The book gave me the impression that he walked in, and they were like, dude, you can't go there, it's fucking cold. And he's like, watch me, and he leaves, and they're all just like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> like, I didn't really yeah. get the idea that they were gonna band behind him. Yeah, no, I agree with D. <laughs> they definitely were just like... Impression- Good that luck. his boat friend like came along after him and was like, "You just fucking let him go." Come I on. totally forgot the boat guy was boat, there. Boat friend didn't exist except in the book, and I didn't even understand why there was no need to have that exchange. The boat friend exists to fill the plot hole. No, there's no plot hole. It, it, the book, no. the book, for some reason, stopped spoon feeding me at the one time I like really needed the help understanding. <laughs> like, like, like the book set it up that he just shows up and he's like. He, like, he storms into the post office and he goes, I'm going there. And everyone's like, that's great. Leave. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, We got close for the winter, buddy. (laughs) All right. So, so, all right. So now that we've had 9,000 digressions in this fucking episode. So, (laughs) Alan shows up. Edith is close to death. He sets her leg and is like, we're going to get out of here. And then he does the dumb thing where he's like. eye doctor. Yeah, whatever. Doctors, doctors (laughs) told you to like. Fucking drink blood to get rid of your ghosts in your blood or whatever and, like, do fucking heroin (laughs) to solve things. So, like, whatever. Doctors had a variety of skills and ideas. Uh, Anyway, so, and like we talked about, he stupidly tells the evil people, like, I know you're evil and I'm gonna just leave now. And they're like, nope. And they, you know, fucking stab him. (laughs) No shit. Um, So Alan is stabbed. Does Lucille stab him? Yeah. Yeah, Lucille stabs him, and then uh, Thomas fake stabs him because, you see, he's had enough of this scheming now because he had sex with Edith one time, and I guess she's way better than his sister. Yeah, Yeah. she had that good coochie, and it turned him good. Dude, that new pussy, I'm telling you. Mm. Your adopted show me where. (laughs) Yeah, also the gayest scene. Oh, God. (laughs) In the movie. Oh, yeah, actually, when you guys watch the movie, I, uh, you spent a few minutes on your podcast talking about how they, like, weirdly interlocked legs for, like, a few seconds and it didn't make any sense. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. After saying, show me where to touch you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so, so in this incredibly, like, in this increasingly stupid film, I um, understand why I thought the twist was gay and not incest. Yes, I do. But so anyway, <laughs> rub cocks. All right. So oh Jesus. Whoa. So all right. So Lucille, <laughs> Lucille stabs Alan, and then she's like, "Thomas, you have to do a murder now. I always do the murder. You do the final murdering." And he's like, "Okay." He takes a knife, <laughs> and instead of instead of just and, and again, his back is to Lucille, and he and Alan are facing out like out to the the moors or whatever out the front door and instead of just be instead of just pretending to have stabbed him because he is already bleeding profusely he says tell me where to stab you you're a doctor you know where it's gonna like not kill you and that just doesn't make sense to me because <laughs> it would have been really <laughs> cool if alan had been like i'm an eye doctor and i guess technically that won't kill me <laughs> <laughs> No, but but like the stupid thing is, Alan is like, oh uh, yeah, somewhere in my abdomen, and I was like, no, why would you That's do that? The worst like, place. yeah, like they easily could have totally faked it, but neither of them thought of that, and so Alan gets stabbed again. <laughs> <laughs> the best, the best part of that for me is that. Alan's a doctor, right? Like, granted, he's an eye doctor, but he's a doctor. But the book has his internal monologue as the bowel, the intestines, the appendix. Those are all <laughs> my guts, my guts, yeah. and my guts. Yeah, yeah really. Like, that's not. <laughs> in my medical <laughs> medical opinion, you shouldn't stab me. Is really the source is in <laughs> Alan. 
<laughs> yeah. So so that was dumb. And then he stabs him again. And then like there's no real explanation, but Thomas takes him downstairs to the basement. Because I guess that's where they put all their evidence and bodies anyway. But he's, like, still alive and, like, limping, so Lucille isn't, like, going, like, no, you should, like, can't stab him in the throat, dude. Don't take him downstairs while he's still alive. <laughs> all right. So Thomas takes him to the basement, and Lucille assumes he's going to just dispose of his body down there. But instead, Thomas is like, I'm going to help you leave. You and Edith are going to get out of here. I'll see to it. And, you know, Alan's like, I'm basically dying from massive amounts of blood loss, so whatever. Um... And, I don't know, Edith, like, comes to and fight and fights with Lucille. They have a fight in the clay vat area, and then they go up outside and have a fight around the fucking shitty machine that Thomas built. Um, but that, weirdly, the machine is working, and neither of them gets injured by it, which is really unfortunate. <laughs> Ken's, Ken's biggest issue with either the book or the movie. No one dies in the murder machine right. that mines blood red clay right. and was specifically right. built with money from murdered women. Right. Yeah. No right. one dies in the murder machine. Why do we even have this? Why it's did we because... even build this murder machine, Lucille? <laughs> <laughs> it's because Thomas is an idiot. And so is Edith for looking at that thing for a second thinking it would work. Because all it does is dump clay back on itself. And I don't <laughs> understand. And I said this, and Chris was like, I don't know. That seems kind of weird that they would show you this machine that doesn't actually work. And I was like, no, it doesn't look like it does. But we, we didn't know enough about clay harvesting to really prove it. But I was pretty sure that it definitely didn't work. <laughs> it runs backwards. It literally runs backwards. Backwards. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really yeah. Silly. It's 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 strange that the machine ends up becoming like easier to cut from the film even than the ghosts. True. Oh God. True. You didn't have to even have the machine there <laughs> for right. any so reason. Like, why beating Lucille to death with a shovel is so much harder than just <laughs> shoving her into the machine? Especially when you have a broken leg and you're extremely poisoned. <laughs> Yeah, and, and there's <laughs> a snowstorm happening. With the shovel and let her fall in the grindy, grindy gears yeah. of the bloody murder yeah. machine. Yeah. So, so anyway, <laughs> they have their final battle, you know, out in the snowstorm by the machine, and of course, oh, oh, oh fuck, we forgot we to forgot say to that say. Lucille murdered Thomas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh yeah, because she just totally kill him. In his final <laughs> moment of sheer stupidity, he tells her that he had sex with someone else than her. Which you probably would have picked up by now with the way you guys have been pawing at each other and saying, only you, only you forever. That she wouldn't let that go over super easy. In the book, he also, much like Dr. Allen, he also goes, I really shouldn't piss her off right about now. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, I fucked her. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it makes no sense. And and also, uh, the one of the weirder parts of that whole sequence, because of course you know once he says that he sealed his fate, you know, and she stabs him uh, in the chest, I believe. And also, she's already been stabbed by Edith with a pen. Um, we've kind of forgot because about that, too. Because the pen is mightier than the sword. Literally. She's a writer. Oh. Do you get it? That's, <laughs> it's also in the How book. Droll. It's also in the book. There's a whole scene where she's like, the pen is mightier than the sword. It doesn't feel like it. And I was like, you get it. Stop. You gotta stop. Yeah, you get it. It's really <laughs> bad. Let me be free. <laughs> no. You're trapped. Uh, and so Lucille is already stabbed in roughly the heart-ish area, the upper left chest with a pen. Uh, but yeah, Thomas finds her and is like, I'm tired of this. Meh, I definitely fucked her. And Lucille's like, yeah, well, you're going to die then. And so she stabs him. And then so she stabs him like once or twice in the chest and then in the cheek and into his eye. And I didn't really <laughs> yeah. understand that choice. It seemed very odd. It's because she's the crazy. She's so wacky. Yeah, uh, yeah and then weird. she's crying after because, you know. Yeah, and then and then she's like, oh, no, I've killed him. And it's like, yeah, dude, you stabbed him like three fucking times. Of course you killed yeah, him. You, like, you really idiot. killed him. Yeah, like you really did it. And so anyway, so Thomas dies. Um, and then Lucille and fucking Edith are having their final battle outside by the death machine. And that no one dies in. No, that no one dies in. <laughs> and Lucille is like. I'm not going I'm not going to stop until you kill me or I kill you. And of course, 
you know, Edith finally smashes her in the head with a shovel enough times that she's dead, you know, and... Because and she Edith. distracted her with Thomas's ghost by saying, right. look behind you, there's a ghost. <laughs> and you <laughs> tried to, to murder someone there. with look a knife. There. <laughs> decide to turn around to so look. So dumb. Okay, how funny would it have been in the movie if she'd said that and there was nothing there? <laughs> would have been really good. Also, how funny it was Thomas's ghost. He looked like a stray Jeez. member of Flesh God Apocalypse. Like, like, <laughs> so, like <laughs> just wandered in. Yeah, like so stupid. Like the ghost so gestation dumb. period <laughs> seems real short too. Like, I guess you just get already as soon as oh, you. My doorbell just rang. Sorry the about last, that. The last breath just leaves your body. That you're automatically a ghost out there. Hey guys, that doorbell ringing, that means my Friday night has to start soon. So like, let's let's wrap the shit up. All well, right. I mean, that's pretty much the end of the story because yeah. then it's just like Edith murdered her. The end. I don't know how she's going to get back. I guess Alan oh, takes her back home, then right? She and Alan reunite in the storm and then they as they're limping out of Allerdale Hall, you can see this huge group of dudes with torches and the townspeople came to save them again it's just a really convenient way to tie everything up and of course the you know i i don't know about the book but at the end of the movie they make it very obvious that the story that you read was the book that edith was writing <laughs> yeah that's right i don't think in the book that they make that as clear but um, no because it's fucking stupid because that means she wrote a book before like that the book she was writing in that Thomas saw was the thing the story about them or is this a yeah. different book that she wrote I don't fuck it fuck it I hate it all it's all dumb don't fucking <laughs> watch it She failed at fiction so she lapsed into memoir is what happened Okay yeah, all right, right. exactly <laughs> very well put Ken So um so f the two final things we have to cover is can we fix it and would you read it uh, actually let's do those in reverse order should people read this I say fuck no Nah. No. It's yes. better than the movie, though, so it's, if you have to watch the movie or read the book, I guess read the book. No, the movie's got nah. visuals. The movie, movie's way better, and you don't have Edith's idiot in her voice. Yeah. Yeah, movie all the way. Uh, yeah, you know what? Fair point. Because there's something to look at. I, I changed my mind. I yeah, changed my mind. I would, I, would, I would also say, like, if you have to choose, watch the movie, because you're only going to sacrifice, like, two hours of your precious lifeblood to it. Um, rather than like the five or six hours it took me to read the book or maybe not even that long, but I, was cr I cranked this out in three hours at the gym Whoa. <laughs> at the gym. <laughs> <laughs> it was three trips to the gym, but like, literally what kind of, flexing what kind of, on us. Okay. Wait, I'm what are you doing flexing. at the gym where you could read a book? Cardio. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Just a I very climb, sweaty copy now, that's all. I, I, oh, it's a I stinky up, copy. I, I climb up walls at the gym, so I can't I can't read, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, before before we close out, I do have some notes. Oh, yes. Hit Just us with it. Hit us with the notes. Okay. So we do know exactly how old Edith is because she tells us in her inner monologue by saying, and I quote Oh dear, I'm only 24, and it appears that I'm already a crotchety misanthrope. God damn it, Ken, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm Which an is, asshole. I would constantly think, find myself thinking that to myself. No, absolutely, that's absolutely how my thoughts in my own goddamn head run. It's, ugh. And, yeah, okay. except replace 24 with ancient, the age that I am. <laughs> yeah, a, dead already, a corpse. And there is a point in uh, chapter three, if I could just read verbatim for a bit. <laughs> Let's do it. Sir Thomas Sharp, baronet, she read aloud. Then it dawned on her that this was Eunice's aristocrat, her parasite. Good lord, she was a crotchety misanthrope. She was the Elizabeth Bennet of her day. In Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen's heroine had come to the exact same foregone conclusion about Mr. Darcy, who had been rakishly handsome and debonair, yet upper class, and therefore worthy of Elizabeth's middle class contempt for a do nothing snob. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Listen. Lot, wow. There. So the book is holding your hand so hard that it doesn't get under it doesn't expect you to get a Pride and Prejudice reference, which is like the one book from the 19th century everyone's at least familiar with if they haven't read. But also, it gets it wrong. <laughs> the explanation is completely wrong. Oh no. <laughs> because Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy are the same class. Oh. They're both upper class. They both employ servants. Neither one was raised with the expectation they would ever work for a living. The only difference is that Mr. Darcy has slightly more money. That's it. <laughs> and oh. if I might quote Elizabeth Bennet herself, 
He is a gentleman. I am a gentleman's daughter. So far, we are equal. <laughs> <laughs> dude, dude, wait, I have... Is... <laughs> wait, can I can I also rant about something related? Yeah. So, yeah. at the towards the beginning, uh, there's a brief altercation between Edith and Eunice's mother, Mrs. McMichael, and, and, and Eunice is like, I don't know, trio of fucking cackling hens or whatever, and... <laughs> Uh, and the mother is like, oh, well, I, I don't know. She says something like, oh, you're just a, a regular Jane Austen or whatever. And, uh, and Edith is like, I prefer to be Mary Shelley. And I was like, yo, that has some connotations. Let me tell you about the Shelleys. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, foreshadowing. I was like, yeah, like. Like, Mary Shelley died a widow, but, like, before that, she and fucking Lord Byron had, like, an open relationship and shit. Like, they that shit was... That they shit was partied. crazy. Yeah, so I was like, I don't know if you know what you're saying by by making that comparison. <laughs> well, so, it's also that comparison was specifically to call uh, Edith a virgin, essentially, because Mrs. McMichael's like, oh, Jane Austen, who died a spinster. And I'm just like, actually, she died a lesbian. So, like, <laughs> again, virgin. are we sure the twist isn't homosexuality? Ugh, are we sorry. sure? Sorry, are sorry, Andy sure? Freaks. It's, it's just not gay. It's not as gay as you hope. Sorry. Sorry. Well, hey, okay. I, I, and also, I do have to cut in with a question that I'm really surprised no one brought up yet. How did you all feel about the house being a character? I hated it. <laughs> I hated it so fucking much. I Wait, was the house. Going, the house the, is a the character. Bringing up the house chapter. So when was all... the house a character? The house was the it. The house was a point. The it from part. The point she gets to the house. The house is a point of view character. No, those are ghosts. Those are no. The house. The house That's the house. Is parents. No, the ghosts those are ghosts. Also, it says it. It says those it are ghosts. Those. No, are ghosts. I think it's I, the house, my dude. It's no. Put her down and make her spin. The house's favorite toy. Favorite toy. The house's favorite toy. Still a tricks to perform and miles to go before she's left. Like it says, it's the house. It's oh, the God house. Damn it. The unknown watcher is the house, and I know because my my notes at that point say, "Shut up, house." <laughs> <laughs> okay, I thought it was the individual ghosts uh, taking no. over. No, because uh, like I, it bothered me so bad that like I paid a lot of attention to those parts, and a lot of times it takes the view of something watching the ghosts. So at which point you're supposed to be like, it's the stupid goddamn idiot dumb fucking house. And the only reason it's a thing is so that the book can have the same jump scares as the film. Yeah. Because there are several jump scares in the film where, like, Edith doesn't see the ghost, but the audience does. And it's like, oh, when she, will she notice the ghost? But there's no audience in the book. And it's not visual. So you just have to. Yeah, it's, so, pre- so it's the, pretty the, stupid. The house has to be watching. <laughs> all right. So, so I think we all agree, like, don't read this fucking book. Can we fix it? No, because the entire yes, thing yes. is a nightmare. We can I fix think, it. I think How? you can fix it if you cut out all the ghost stuff and just make it a slow burn, like, gothic romance thriller thing with a completely different set of mechanisms for Edith to find out what's going on. You have to rip that whole part out, you well, know, you'd also have to. Stem. I'm with Chris on that. Yeah, well, you'd yeah, also 100%. have to get get rid of all the fucking ham-fisted metaphors and, like... No, yeah, you could keep like the moth stuff, and you could keep like the red clay thing, like if if you want. But just like get rid of the ghosts, and you have to not have it be wax cylinders and a trunk that they left lying around for Edith to find. There has and to be someone someone yeah, in the machine yeah. at the end. Yeah, yeah. I will that's yeah. this book in one sentence. It's okay. gay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's well, giving I, me a look I that just, I guessed it correctly. I just also <laughs> think that. Well, the other the other thing we'd have to fix is. Nothing. I I wouldn't want any of the spoon fed to you. So it would have to be really, uh, it has to be redone from a really yeah really like atomic level. And yeah, maybe it would be better suited to something like the Haunting of Hill House, where it was like a longer um, series rather than just a film. I think I think it would work better yes. that way. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, I so think yeah. That's also okay. Good. All right, so, so we've got good notes, so let's compile these, send them to Del Toro, so he doesn't continue <laughs> to make these mistakes. Because Wait, I can really... you have more notes? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry. It's just, they continued being wrong about Pride and Prejudice, but also... <laughs> like, several points they were wrong about Pride uh, can, and Prejudice. Can I make a, a confession? I've never read it. Neither okay. have I. Neither I was have too I. busy <laughs> having, like, huge meat. <laughs> 
I well, then, I should tell you that you as for Elizabeth coming having... to quote the exact same I'm... foregone conclusion what? about Mr. Darcy, she never once thinks of him as a parasite because she herself and her entire family are also parasites because they are the same class. Uh, yep. Nah, I didn't read any of D, it. D, D, also, D, Mr. Darcy D. himself is not rakishly handsome and debonair. He is acceptable in the face and so cripplingly socially awkward that he comes off as standoffish and rude. The rakishly handsome and debonair character is Wickham the villain. And furthermore, while Elizabeth is just generally accepted as the prejudice half of Pride and Prejudice, she is not prejudiced against Mr. Darcy for his class. She is prejudiced against him because of his awkward behavior and because of malicious gossip and lies from, again, Wickham the villain. Sorry. Can we- you guys are going to leave that in, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wait, wait, Chris, can. can you speed it up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that I don't appreciate your... Um, your level of detail in the in the analysis. I know you have to go. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Can we just rewind to when I think Dee said that she didn't read Pride and Prejudice because she was too busy having meat. Huge meat, yeah. Huge meat. What? Um, <laughs> can you explain? I got huge meat. You were too bu- like. Were you too busy having like big steaks or like fucking dudes? Because I I both. don't understand both. <laughs> like, why not both at the same time? <laughs> or both? Yeah, it could be both. <laughs> I had I, I had I had some fucking beefy dudes cooking me up some beefy beef, and I couldn't read Pride and Prejudice. You nerd. <laughs> says says the person who who did theater with me for like five years. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, and majored in art. I know. Uh, uh, oh, that's so okay. great. Okay, so uh, throughout the book, they refer to Lucille as Lady Sharp. Yes. Wouldn't be the case. That's yeah. bogus as fuck because the children oh, of a really? baronet are not entitled to the use of any courtesy. Ch- they don't get oh. any courtesy titles. She That's is Miss Sharp from the day she's born until the day she dies. Huh. She is never. She would never be Lady Sharp under any circumstances. But she was his wife, so it's like foreshadowing. That's the thing. Like, is it foreshadowing or is it lazy writing? We just don't know. She's a sister wife. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. It's lazy well, writing. Let me answer that. So, what so about I guess... the corsets? <laughs> well, what about the corsets? Oh Jesus! So I think I think with a lot of revisions, it could be fixed. Um, yeah, I think so. I think that there's like a, the the kernel of a good story. Literally, just make them lesbians. It fixes everything. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, with that, uh, <laughs> wow. I, I would like to say though that in general, I, I like a lot of Guillermo del Toro films. Like Pan's Labyrinth is brilliant. Um, I love the orphanage. Uh, the Devil's Backbone was pretty good. Like he's got a whole host of other film. Oh, what was um that film that was on the Criterion? Uh, it was like a it was a vampire film, but it was really good. Uh, the Chronal Chron Ah, Chron- uh, fuck, I can't remember. Anyway, he's got a lot of great films. Uh, this one you're, though, you're really I deep cutting the Del Toro line there. Don't yeah. love. <laughs> I was like, I don't think a lot of people have watched any of the films you mentioned. <laughs> But he he's makes, labyrinth. he makes some really great films, but this this one just doesn't do it for me, uh, and the the novel certainly didn't either. So um, I, I, counterpoint: yeah. this is his best film. I think that he's definitely oh, one of those filmmakers that Ken, suffers I gotta, when nobody's I gotta, editing. I gotta like drink on another fucking floor of my house. <laughs> uh, not joking, literally, <laughs> literally gonna go downstairs and drink and watch like cute animals or something in a minute. But um, yeah, so. Uh, I don't know. I think we've covered everything. Uh, I'm really glad that Dean and Ken were here again because they're always great. Thank guests. you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> you <laughs> sound so sincere. I believe I believe <laughs> no, that we, we do I, have I, like a future collabo coming up, right? Like we did find a shitty antiques based book. D- did because we? I never want to let you guys go. I'll never. Oh, let you Oh no, go. I'll never let you go either. I'm glad that we didn't. I'm glad that we didn't get divorced on the podcast today. We almost got podcast divorced, but we avoided it, and that was really. We won't. Important. We never will. We'll always Good. make it work, even if I find the wax cylinders in your closet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good lord! Um, all right, so I guess uh, I guess if we have nothing else, we can close. Yeah. Um, all right. Cool. So thanks, of course. Many, many, many eternal thanks for to D and Ken for being here today and for sending us this book. That was great. Thank you so much for having us and entertaining all the shrieking. Uh, yeah. We'd like to thank our Patreon supporters, of course, uh, one of whom is D themselves. <laughs> uh, yes. the, the rest the rest of them, though, are Dari, Greg, Will, Veronica, Jared, Lynn, Sidna, Jakob, Torben, a.k.a. Duck King, Bobby Blackcat, Ayame, Jensina, Mayo Cat, and Elliot. If you, too, would like to support the show, you can head over to patreon.com slash join slash terrible book club to become a patron. Um, at the $5 a month level or higher, you can enjoy special video segments, 
uh, like Chris and I watching Crimson Peak um, and download these audio tracks so you can uh, watch the movies with us. You can also listen to the show on the Radio Public app. The app is free and that helps passively generate income for the show. So if you cannot or are unwilling to just directly give money to the show, if you listen to us on Radio Public, you can just give us money passively that way. You can also share the share episodes and links to the show on social media or just tell a friend. Um, and lastly, you can always leave us a review on iTunes or some other platform. And remember that we always enjoy interacting with you, so you can reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Goodreads, or you can send us an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com. Um, and don't forget about the Antiques Freaks, so you can listen to their show. I highly recommend it. Um, you know, full disclosure, D-, D-, D and I went to high school together. That's how, that's how we know each other. That's how this is happening. But uh, Antiques Freaks is genuinely an excellent podcast. I learn about things, and I laugh so hard that I disturb people while I walk to and from work <laughs> routinely Aww. every Wednesday. Um, what are you laughing really... so much about, uh, antiques? Dude, it's <laughs> fucking hilarious. It's like, funny. it's really good. Uh, so definitely listen to their show. Um, like I said, they have an episode on the Crimson Peak film. So if you want to learn about like hair receivers and hair crafts and uh, some other things about the film, like the costuming and the props, listen to that episode. Um, uh, but all the other episodes are great too. I mean, I would... Some I would point to are like the Beanie Babies episode, the Danger Mercury episode. Those are great <laughs> older ones. I love those. Uh, but there are plenty of great ones. Uh, so yeah, thanks for we being here. We just released uh, Vampire Hunting Kits. Yeah, yeah. I'm very pleased with how that one is. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any final closing thoughts but uh i would like to go have a friday night for like an hour or two with my bandmates so that's <laughs> that's what i'm gonna go do <laughs> i'm already i'm already to like uh probably the equivalent of like four beers in so <laughs> all right drunk, all right, you well, get you gone <laughs> yeah yeah go have your fun i'm going to bed early because i have work tomorrow but <laughs> lame yeah oh I know, you're right? like you're like the alan of this story i know sensible i know <laughs> Wait, who, who the, the fuck am I? This is hogging the only brain cell out of girls. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? Who am I? <laughs> oh, am I the you should house? All have, you should have all listened to your fathers and dated me, but no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> all right. Bye, Antiques And I freaks. think that's a perfect note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, Bye, everyone. Paris. Good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>